Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail. He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold. He must hold.
Good morning and welcome to worship at Blues Federated Church. We're glad you could be with us. Would you join me in prayer? O oh, author of life, you cast your glory all around us. You invade our sleep. You reveal yourself in ancient stories and the give and take of common life. By the power of your spirit, come to us now, for you have called us to this place. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our hope, our confidence, and your beloved Son. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, and again, welcome to worship at Palouse Federated Church. My name is Tim Sievers. I'm the Connection Director here at the church, and I'm glad you could join us uh, wherever you are, uh, since we are not gathering uh, at the church for worship. We know some of you are online, you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, you may be in the parking lot uh, listening on 107.5 FM. Uh, you may be at your homes listening on 107.5 FM. Wherever you are, we're glad you're with us. If you are new uh, to our church and our community of faith, we wanna uh, welcome you. Uh, that's hard to do, of course, if we don't know you're here. So we'd love for you to uh, leave a comment on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, send us a note in the mail, send us an email to welcome at palousechurch.org and we can send you a welcome pack and tell you a little bit more about uh, Palouse Federated Church, who we are and what we believe and uh, how you can connect to our mission and ministries. Uh, and we'd love for you to join us uh, on Wednesday evenings for our weekly radio, uh, radio time. Uh, I don't know, we need a better, I guess I need some better language around that, but uh, on Wednesdays from 5 to 7 p.m. we're broadcasting here in Palouse on 107.5 FM and you can tune in and listen to hymn sings and podcasts and um, all sorts of different programming that we have. We had live programming this past Wednesday, we don't do that every, every week, but we talked, uh, we had people call in and share about their Independence Day plans and, and uh, so that was a lot of fun. And, and uh, since I mentioned Independence Day, it was yesterday. Happy Independence Day. Uh, and uh, uh, last announcement is that we are going to be doing communion today. So uh, if you are at home and you wanna stop right now and take a moment to go and gather your materials, you should do that. Find some sort of bread or cracker, uh, whatever you can find for bread and, and a juice of some sort, um, whatever works for you. Get those ready so you have it when it's time for communion, which will follow uh, the sermon today. Well, let's continue our worship with the reading of scripture. Our call to worship today comes from the Song of Solomon, the second chapter, verses 8 through 13. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bouncing over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flower appear, flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree ripens its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Now is the time of singing. It has come. So uh, why don't you join us in singing our songs of praise. Oceans rise, my soul will rest in your air. 
online you can do that in the comments on Facebook or YouTube you also can send us an email at prayer at palousechurch.org or you can call the office 878-1509 and uh, let us know but we want to be a praying people we are called to be a praying people it's how we communicate our heart to God and how God um, communicates his heart to us and so we need to be listening and waiting to hear his voice and and so we're going to do that uh, together as a congregation here in the next few moments. Uh, and we're going to begin by praying as Jesus taught us to pray. And when we've concluded that, I'll lead us in our congregational prayer, which will include some time of silence uh, and for us to listen for God's voice. Would you join me in praying? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Compassionate God, you are good to all. Help us to trust your word. Help us to accept your invitation. Help us to find rest in you. We pray for your church. O oh God, in all of its forms, that we may learn how to follow Jesus by giving rest to the weary, that we may learn to follow Jesus in lives of service that are gentle and humble of heart. O oh, compassionate God, you are good to all. We pray for all people, for their nations and their leaders, that when the burdens of war and poverty and hunger are too much to bear, we may do our part, O oh God, to offer rest and peace. Compassionate God, you are good to all. We pray for all those who suffer violence in the streets and in their homes, that they might find safety and healing. We pray for those who are sick, those who struggle with moral dilemmas. Uphold them and grant them peace. Compassionate God, you are good to all. Gracious and merciful God, creator of heaven and earth, we join our voices with all that you have made in blessing you and giving thanks to you who with Jesus and the Holy Spirit show compassion and goodness to all. Amen.
We're going to continue our worship with the reading of Scripture. We're uh, currently journeying through uh, Romans, and so we're going to be in chapter 7, verses 15 through uh, the beginning of verse 25. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that is good, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, in this moment of stillness, wash us clean of our presumptions. Receive us as your weary children, and then by the power of your Spirit, bless, bless us with a word that revives, for we pray in the name of Jesus, your living word. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in the midst of our summons, summer sermon series. Summer sermon series. That's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, True Grit true grace. It's a study of the book of 1 Peter. And so far as we've uh, started our journey, uh, we have obtained some handles for understanding the letter uh, that Peter is encouraging the Christians to whom he is writing to live lives of true grit and true grace. That is that they must persevere in the midst of the trials that they face and that they are called to live gracefully in the midst of their suffering. And Peter's going to give some instruction to his audience about what that means and what that looks like. And Peter's first letter was written to the churches in Asia Minor, or what we today call Turkey. It was written as an encouragement to the minority group of Christians who were uh, facing immense pressure from the culture to conform to the secular patterns of uh, the society. And the culture pressed hard for them to turn away from the monotheism of uh, their culture, excuse me, from the monotheism of Christianity and return to the polytheism of their culture and Roman society. And the culture pressed them hard too to give up the righteous living that God had called uh, the Christians to follow and to embrace instead the widespread immorality that was also a mark of the Roman culture. And Peter began uh, his letter by recognizing that his audience was scattered, uh, scattered stra strangers who suffer. And he recognized, too, that they would face trials, right? They would face trials uh, because of their faith in Christ and also just because they live in a broken world, just like we do. We live in a broken world. And sometimes things are hard. And he used the image of gold being refined by fire. Uh, to help the Christians who were there in Asia Minor to understand that though they may feel as if they are being tested by fire, what comes out of the fire is purer, more valuable, and more beautiful, uh, and it's good. And Peter's letter speaks to the darkness in which his audience was living, and it proclaims boldly that they are to take heart he says, I know it's dark. I know it doesn't feel like you can see. I know you're afraid. I know you feel alone. I know you feel lost, but don't give up now. Right? That's what we talked about that last week. He said, don't give up now. Don't lose hope. Don't lose heart. Keep going. The end is worth it. The end is worth it. 
These trials that you face, they're, they're just temporary, but the triumph to come is eternal. So yes, you will suffer, he says. Yes, you will have hardship. Yes, difficult days are coming, or, or, or maybe you're already living in difficult days. Yes, there will be trials. Yes, there will be grief, but there is hope, and there is joy in the midst of the suffering, and that hope and that joy comes from knowing and believing that God through the resurrection of Jesus has called us to an inheritance that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading and that we are in fact children of God and heirs of the kingdom. And that is why we can have hope and joy even today in the midst of our suffering and our trials because we have that truth that we are children of God and we are heirs of the kingdom. And when we are tested, those trials open our hearts and our minds to see God for who he really is, that he is gracious and, and loving and merciful. And the fire of our trials helps us to, uh, to refine us and remove our impurities and make us more like Jesus. And in the midst of our trials, Peter has told us so far that we are called by God to resist the cultural pressures and to love and serve our neighbors, not just the person next door, that's not what a neighbor is, but all of humanity, all of humanity, the poor, the immigrant, the widow, the orphan, those who don't look like us, talk like us, believe like us, worship like us, vote like us, we are called to love and serve them all. And now, in our next section, Peter continues his instruction with a call to holiness and to love. And that's where we're going to uh, focus our attention today. So I want to invite you to join me in reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25. In my ESV version, it was titled, Called to be Holy. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. I love the beginning of that scripture. It's really a call to, to action. It's, uh, that, that's what it is. This is not passive. This is an active and an involved process, a process of, of discipline, of setting your hope on the grace on, uh, of God, on the reward that's to come in the end, and, and remembering that goal and persevering to that goal. And Paul writes and he says, therefore, prepare your minds for action and be sober minded. In another uh, translation, and we'll, we'll visit this again later in the message, but in another translation, it says, gird up the loins of your mind. It says, get ready, get ready, get ready for battle. 
And be disciplined. Be disciplined. This is a time for action. And, and Peter says, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In, in verse 14. He's going to have a, a conversation now about the difference between conformity and holiness. He says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Instead, he says, be holy. Be holy in all your conduct. In verse 15. Why? Well, because God said so. He said to do so. And the call to holiness is a long-standing call in the Hebrew culture that goes back at least, at least to the Exodus, if not before. Uh, you might remember, if you've read through the book of Leviticus, God said in chapter 11, verse 44, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore. Be holy, for I am holy. So there's this call to be holy that goes back not, I mean, this is thousands of years this goes back, and God is calling his people to holiness. Also in Leviticus, in the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 5, we read, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you live, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you, you shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. In the call to holiness, Peter also says, recognizes that his audience of Christians was ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from their forefathers. And they were ransomed not with, with money. With, that's how we pay ransom these days. You know, if somebody's kidnapped and they ask for ransom, they usually ask for money. You pay, pay for, to get that which was taken back with, with uh, gold or silver or dollar bills. But, but they were ransomed, and we too are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. God ransom, ransoms us from the feudal ways of our forefathers through the shed blood of Christ and his resurrection so that our faith and our hope are in God. So God has long called his people to be set apart and to be holy as he is holy, to not live as the world lives, but to live by his rules, by his statutes, to walk in his ways, because to do so brings life. Walking in the ways of God brings life. Now before we get to, I know you're all wondering, well, how do we do that then, right? How do we live these holy lives? We first need to understand what is a holy life. Uh, what is holy living? What does it look like? And you re, if we remember that, that call from verse 13 that we are to prepare our minds for action, to be sober-minded and, and disciplined, we know that it's an active process that requires uh, discipline and commitment. Uh, you got to really work at it. And you can't work towards holiness by simply putting it on over your sinfulness. And you hear that? You can't work towards holiness by simply putting it on over your sinfulness. To be like Christ, to be holy as God is holy, we cannot be in any way conformed to the patterns of this world, but we must be conformed instead to the image of Jesus. We need to imitate him and be like him in our thoughts, in our emotions, in our, in our intellect, in our behavior, and in every way we need to be like Jesus. And the Apostle Paul gives us a lot of help in this regard in terms of what does it, what does, uh, what does it look like to live like Jesus? And he gives us some great handles uh, for what we need to cut out of our lives and what we need to add. In Philippians 2, he writes to the church in Philippi and he calls them to have the same mind, the same love, and to lives of humility and he sets Christ as the example of that. Listen to what Paul writes in Philippians 2. 
He says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Be like Jesus. And that's a great passage that Paul gives us to help us know what does it mean to live like Jesus, to live in humility, to put the needs of others instead of ahead of our own, to serve, uh, to serve others. And broadly speaking, the Bible gives us two ways that we can become like Christ. Uh, it tells us that we can stop, we can stop doing some things, and we can start doing some things. Or, in the words of Paul, he says you can put on, or put on and put off. And so, Peter says, don't be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance and the futile ways you inherited from your forefathers. And Paul, in his writing, he tells us exactly what that looks like. He tells us exactly what it looks like. You just look in the book of Colossians in the third chapter and in verses 5 through 10. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, right? That's the feudal ways inherited from our forefathers. In these ways you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And Paul had given us in Philippians earlier a great image of our Creator. Those behaviors that he lists there in his letter to the Colossians are indicative of the passions of our former ignorance and the futile ways that we inherited from our forefathers, and we must put them to death. They are sinful, they violate God's call to holiness, and they've got to go. And you can't just cover them up with holiness. You've got to get them out of your life. And we have to be honest about our sin if we're going to put it to death. And we have to be serious if we're going to take action to do that. And, and, and John Owen provides a, a multi-step process for effectively waging war against sin in our lives. And I want to share that with you. I think it could be helpful for us as we talk about getting those futile ways of our forefathers out of our lives. He says, first, it is critical that we evaluate our sin and consider how deeply rooted it is in our lives. That will give us some measure of what it will take to cut it out. If it comes naturally, if it comes subconsciously, and we are led to sin again and again, we will need an extra measure of God's help to overcome it. So we have to evaluate our sin. And after we identify the nature of our sin, we have to fill our mind and our conscience with the guilt and the weight of that sin. You have to understand what it means. What it means. You need to see it for what it is. You need to recognize that your sin is a willful rebellion against God. And you need to be wary that as you consider your sin, it always, it always seeks to rationalize itself. 
And your mind will get to work and you'll, find, you'll, you'll hear yourself saying, well, at least my sin isn't like such and such. At least my sin isn't like so and so. But it's never about someone else's sin. That's not your problem. Your problem is your sin. My problem is my sin. It's about our sin. When we filled our mind with, our, with the severity of our sin, then we can look to the gospel. We can look to the cross. We can look to what Christ did on the cross, not yet to the forgiveness, not yet. But we look to the cross and we recognize that there is a very real cost to sin. There's a very real cost to sin. And, and that's made real in the suffering and the death of Jesus. And as we, as we um, fill our, our mind with those thoughts, we can consider, too, God's uh, graciousness throughout our lives. And think of how we've treated his sacrifice. Let it all sink in and feel the weight of the sin. It's important that we feel the weight of our sin. And next, uh, Owen says that we should long for deliverance from that sin. Do you long to be free from that which keeps you from being like Christ. If you don't long to be free from it, you won't ever be. But if you truly desire freedom, if you truly long for deliverance, the power of God can take you from the place of despair to transforming grace through repentance. So we evaluate, we fill our mind with the weight of sin, we long for deliverance, and then we consider we consider how this sin manifests itself in our lives. Is there something in our life, is there something in our history or our family history that makes us prone to this sin? Has someone sinned against you? Has someone sinned against you in such a way that um, it has led you to act out in sinful ways? Your answers to these questions don't excuse the sin but they can help identify triggers that lead us to sin and an awareness. It can help us develop an awareness so that when those triggers come, we can fight harder when they show up in our lives. And next we contemplate and we plan. You identify the triggers, what are the patterns that lead to it? Is there some other habit that sets it off? And then you make a plan for how to keep from sinning. And that's going to look different from the sin. It's going to look different for each sin and for, and for you as a person. Uh, it's going to look different from person to person. And you might need somebody to help hold you accountable. And you might need, uh, you might need to develop a, a something that you can put when you start seeing yourself going down that road that, that it triggers in your mind and you say, no, I'm going to pick up my Bible. No, I'm going to call my friend. No, I'm going to turn to Jesus in prayer. Whatever it is, you make a plan. You make a plan to address your sin. And then you've got to commit to the battle because it's not going to be easy. Our ESV translation of uh, 1 Peter 1.13 said, Therefore prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded. But as I mentioned before, other translations say, Gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, get dressed for the battle and discipline yourself to wage war against sin in your life. And com combating sin is an every day affair. And if we call on the Holy Spirit to help you, and, and as we live in community with other Christians, they can strengthen and encourage us in the battle. And finally, we meditate on God's word, and we expect to hear God speak peace to our souls. And we need to be careful that we listen not for our own voice, not for our own voice, which will be quick. It will be quick to say that you've forgiven or that you've, oh, you've been forgiven and you've overcome the sin in your life. But listen for God to speak peace into your life. Listen for God. Wait patiently for him to speak freedom to your heart and to your mind. And those are some steps that we can take to root out that which is bad, the sin from our lives, those, those uh, terrible ways that our forefathers taught us. But Paul also gives a cure in Colossians. Uh, in 3, 12 through 17, he's, 
In, in contrast to what he says we are to put to death, Paul tells the Colossians to uh, put on. He says, put on then, as God's chosen, one, chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love. And that's the same call that Peter gives us at the end of our section of reading. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you uh, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. The NIV says that we are to clothe ourselves with these characteristics. And I love that image. Just as we've taken off all that bad stuff that we then dress and we clothe ourselves, covering ourselves with compassion and humility and kindness and meekness and patience and forgiveness and love. It's not simply enough to take off the bad habits of our former life. It's a start, but we must replace that which we take off with the habits and characteristics of the righteous life, of the holy life. And Paul, Paul gives another illustration of this as he writes to the Galatians, and we call them the fruits of the Spirit. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those are the things that we need to put on. If we fail to put on that which is good, if we don't, uh, if we don't put on those good characteristics, those characteristics of righteous and holy living, if our lives don't bear the fruit of the Spirit, sin will again creep in and take hold in our lives. It is a constant battle, an everyday battle, to put off and put on. But that is what we need, what we need to do to be holy, to live lives of holiness. But how do, we, how do we do that? How do we work toward holiness? And, and I want to be honest in, in saying that you're never going, you're never, I'm never going to reach the state of holiness that God, in which God exists. But that doesn't mean we don't strive to live uh, holy as he is the holy, especially since he called us specifically to do so. But we need to be honest about that. It's simply not possible for those of us who live in this broken world to be holy like God is holy. But we try. We work for it all of our lives. And I think the key to, to achieving holiness and reaching for that holiness lies in uh, spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines. And I know that idea of spiritual disciplines is probably not a popular one. You may not even have heard of them. But spiritual disciplines are ancient practices that uh, have been passed down from the early church that help us. They give us the tools we need to develop our relationship with Jesus and to work toward holiness. And, and, and the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, of the spiritual practices are prayer and Bible study. And I say that not to minimize their importance because they're incredibly important. But those are things that are very common and that probably, you, probably you're familiar with. You've probably been in a service. If you've been in this service, we've prayed. Uh, we've read scripture. But it should be a practice of your everyday life that you pray, that you communicate with God, that you share your heart with him and listen for him to share his heart with you. And also that you, you be in his scripture. In the scripture, we find his heart. We know what he wants us to do by reading the words that he's given us. But that's not all there is. It's not all that there is. 
And the other disciplines are largely uh, ignored by the church and Christians in America today. And I want to, I'm just going to list some of them for you. Silence and solitude. When was the last time you sat in silence for an hour? Where you separated yourself out from the world in a place of quiet. You and God. And listen for him to speak. Silence and solitude. Sabbath. Rest. Sabbath rest. Discernment. Which is something that happens not by yourself. We can easily be fooled in our own discernment. Discernment happens in a group. Gratitude. Honoring your body. Are you taking care of your body well? Fasting. Charity. Worship. Service. Confession. Confession is another one we also, it's not very popular. And it's not just something you do for yourself. It's something we do in community with each other. But it's a practice that has fallen out of favor in the church. Simplicity. How cluttered is your life? Are you living simply? Or do the things that you have, the things that you've accumulated, do they keep you from focusing your attention and your heart on what's really important? On God and on loving your neighbors. And if you consider those practices, even just briefly, you can see how they stand in contrast, I, I would say opposition to our culture today. Silence and solitude stands in opposition to uh, noise, right? Sabbath rest stands in opposition to busyness. How often do we say, I'm so busy, I can't do that. I can't do anything more because I'm just too overwhelmed with all of my responsibilities. That's a choice that you make. God calls us to rest, to Sabbath, to spend time with him. Are you resting? Are you practicing that discipline? Or do you just give in to the busyness of life again and again? You're like a hamster on a wheel and you can never get off. Sabbath stands in opposition to busyness. Self-importance, ingratitude, dishonoring our bodies, not taking care of our physical bodies, which are uh, the temple in which Christ dwells. Indulgence, selfishness, self-centeredness, extravagance. These stand in opposition to spiritual disciplines. And so we need to make goals. <laughs> That sounds, maybe that sounds strange to you, but you have to make goals about spiritual disciplines if you're going to use them as tools to help you develop your relationship with God, to help you cut out that which is bad in your life, and to clothe yourselves with that which is right, with the, with the things that will lead us to holy living, to, to uh, changing our lives into Christ-likeness. It's a lot easier to work towards holiness if you're not listening to your own voice and the voice of your culture, but listening to the voice of God who calls us to holiness. And so I want to submit to you today, if you, if you try any spiritual practice uh, to get started, if, if, if God is convicting your heart, if, if he convicts you of a specific one, that's great. If you don't have an idea, I want to encourage you to start with silence and solitude. And it's so incredibly difficult. And it sounds counterintuitive, but you have to schedule it into your life. You have to put it on the calendar and you have to guard that time, a sacred time. And it's not something, you know, you're, you're not gonna send, spend hours in solitude and silence every day probably. But think about doing it one time this coming week. Think about setting a monthly time where maybe you spend four hours in silence and solitude. Listening to God, clearing your mind of the distractions of this world, because you need space in your life to hear his voice. And it's so hard in our culture, in our noisy, self-indulgent culture, to hear God's voice when all we think about is me and my needs and what I need and what 
Make space. Make space by giving God time. Not five minutes. It takes a long time to clear your mind. I, just as an example, we have, uh, I'm currently in, taking seminary classes for a Master's of Divinity. I'm doing it online through Fuller Theological Seminary. And last year when I first started, in, in the week of Holy Week, which is an incredibly busy, uh, busy week in the life of the church where we have lots of extra, uh, extra events, we had our, our Wednesday soup suppers, we had Monday, Thursday service, Good Friday service, Easter service, the Sunday before was Palm Sunday, and we have a talent show here on that day and a pancake supper. It was a busy week, and my assignment was four hours in silence and solitude. And when you work in a church and Holy Week, where do you find four hours of silence and solitude when you have all those extra events plus all the regular work that you have to accomplish? Where do you find it? So I, on Good Friday, I took some time and I went up uh, here to Kamiak uh, Butte uh, here in Palouse, just outside of Palouse. And uh, I, this is the mentality I went with it, went to it with was that I have to knock this out, right? I have to accomplish it. I don't know, how do I accomplish <laughs> silence and solitude and then I'm gonna move on with my life, I'm gonna get, uh, get beyond it. And so I pulled up into the parking lot and I parked the car and I get out and there's a little trail that heads up the butte and I, I saw a picnic table off to the side there. I was like, I'll sit down at that picnic table. And I sat down at the picnic table and I, I sat quietly and, and it was, my mind was just filled with every distraction there was. There was uh, the planes going overhead, uh, the, the doors shutting in the parking lot the sound of wheels going over gravel, the little birds swooping through the clearing in which I was sitting, the bee going by, and I was like, there is no silence even here in the butte. There's supposed to be silence here. I've come here for silence. I've come here for solitude. I've come here to hear God, and all I hear is the world around me. And, and, and I sat there for probably uh, 20 minutes or so, just really fighting that whole thing and really battling it. And then God put in my voice, in my head, a voice, and He says, um, and I don't, it, it's a reference to something in literature, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure where, but uh, further up and further in, something like that. And I was like, I said, God, I don't want to go further up and further in. I don't want to hike up Kamiak View today. I don't got time for that. I don't. And so I sat there in silence with all that noise going around me, and God keeps saying, further up and further in, Tim, further up and further in. And so finally I said, fine, right? I'll do it. I'll do it. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it. So reluctantly and with a heart that was not set on the right things, I climbed up the view. And I did it pretty quickly because I was angry and frustrated, and I wasn't getting my assignment accomplished. <laughs> it was not good. <laughs> So I trudge my way up there and my mind's not in the right place and finally I get to the top. And just as you get to the top of the trail and you crest the butte, it, uh, you can go down the other side just a little bit and there's a stump that's kind of, it's been felled and it's laid out like a seat. And I sat down there uh, at the top of the butte looking south, uh, I think south out towards uh, Pullman and, and stretched out before me you could see the rolling hills of Palouse and um, you could see uh, just a be the beautiful world that God has given us here in Palouse. And I sat there and all I could hear was the wind. It was just blowing by. It was, I think it was April. It was, it was a little chilly. It was, the wind was blowing. And I sat there and I just was still. I was quiet. I was by myself and I was, um, listening and in those in those moments that I did not expect in those moments that I had fought all morning long God spoke to me and he said this is the place and these are the people that I've called you to. And that for me, that's 
life changing. And since that time, I've had such peace in my heart about this place where I am, about the work that he's given me to do. Why? Because I made space in my life. It was hard, but I made space to listen to his voice. I don't know what God wants to speak to you, but I know it's so hard to hear in the clutter of our lives, with the demands of our schedules and the busyness that we, that we live in. But he wants to talk to you. He wants to speak truth into your life. He wants to give you direction. So if you're going to start anywhere with a spiritual discipline, I want to encourage you to start with the silence and the solitude. It makes space to hear him speak to you. So we faithfully practice the spiritual disciplines. It makes space in our lives for God to speak. It teaches us how to listen. And it can help lead us into holiness. And finally, if we want to work toward holiness in our lives, we have to have a, a sincere longing for it. It can't simply be a passing fancy. It must be a deeply held conviction of our hearts and our minds if we are to overcome our sin and walk in the ways of Christ. And I'm reminded of, a, as I was uh, thinking about our text uh, this week, I was actually in the shower and God brought to my you ever get your best ideas, it seems like, in the shower? I don't know. It's the warm water beating down on you, and you're kind of thinking about things. I'm in the shower, and God brings to mind this song that I haven't sung in I don't know how many years, but I remember singing it in college. It was very popular in the mid-'90s. Uh, I think 96 is when it was written. Uh, made popular by Vineyard Music, and it's called Take My Life. And as we close today, I want to read you the lyrics. And, and suggest, I want to suggest that it be the prayer of your heart today. Holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. So take my heart. Take my heart and form it. Take my mind and transform it. Take my will and conform it to yours, to yours, O oh Lord. Would you pray with me? Take our hearts, O oh God, Take our hearts, O oh God, and form them. Take our minds, transform them. Take our wills and conform them to yours. And may we put off, O oh God, that which keeps us in sin. May we clothe ourselves with that which makes us more like you. And may we truly long for holiness in our lives. Amen. Amen. I want to share with you some next steps uh, that you may want to take today. Uh, our first one is just a repeat. It's going to be up there every week. I want to invite you to consider reading, uh, commit to reading 1 Peter uh, every week this, this summer uh, so that you're constantly in God's Word and you're reading the words of encouragement that Peter is sharing. And as you do so, that's going to prepare your hearts as you come to worship each week. You might say uh, today after hearing uh, the scripture that you recognize that there are habits or practices in your life that you need to put off. 
the first step is to admit that. Say, there are practices in my life I need to put off. And so that might be your first next step. And then if that is how God is working in your heart, I want to suggest to you that you take the next step and say, God, I commit to putting whatever that is off. I'm going to take it off and put it away. And I'm going to suggest that you take the next one as well because uh, they build on each other. You put it off and then you also say, I commit to putting on something else. If you want, and if you want help figuring that out, let us know. Uh, email us at next at palousechurch.org. Tell us what your next steps are. If you want help knowing what you need to replace, what you're taking off with, call me. Let me help you. Let me help you find it in the scripture. We'll talk it through. We'll figure it out. We'll get you, we'll get you on the path towards holiness. You might say that you want someone to hold you accountable for the decisions that you've made today. That's incredibly important. If you commit to it yourself, chances are you're going to fall back into it again. Having an accountability partner can help you stay on track. So that might be your next step. And if it is, I encourage you to find somebody to help keep you accountable. And if you can't find, if there's nobody in your life that makes sense, again, send us a note. Next at PalooseChurch.org. We'll help you. We want to help you be successful and help you work towards holiness if that's a sincere desire and longing of your heart. And finally, you might just say, I will long for holiness this week. Maybe you've probably never said those words out loud, out loud, right? But I long for holiness this week. Start there and see what God has in store for you. Again, just email us next at PalooseChurch.org and uh, let us know uh, what your next step is and how we can help you. Uh, yeah. Well, we're going to move uh, into our time of communion. And uh, I want to invite you, if you have not yet uh, prepared your elements at home, uh, to gather them now. Gather them now. Uh, and prepare your hearts. So we're going to move now into our time of communion. And communion is really a call to remember. A call to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us. A call to remember um, the hope that we have because of that. And so uh, today, as we come to the table of the Lord and we partake of the bread and we partake of the cup, we remember Christ's sacrifice. And as we do so, I want to invite you also to think, uh, think about the message that, we've just, that you've just heard. And God's call to, to holiness. And what does that look like for you in your life today? How can you honor the sacrifice that Christ made uh, when you go from, from wherever you are into the world, into your family, into your workplace? How can this sacrifice transform the way that you live? On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And again, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you to take the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ.
continue our worship through giving at this time. We want to invite you uh, to give and to join in the mission of, of the church in the world and the church here in Palouse. And you can do that by uh, mailing in a contribution. You can do that. Just uh, send a check in the mail to 635 North Bridge Street, uh, Palouse, Washington, 99161. You also can give online. Go to palousechurch.org. Uh, look for the online giving button. You can make your secure donation online there. And you can even text to give. Uh, you just text the word give to 509-774-4942. And it'll walk you through the steps that you uh, can take to give over your phone from wherever you are. Uh, we thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, it's been important to us and our work here. It's allowed us to continue to uh, continue to offer worship services, continue to uh, serve our community and help out at the food pantry and, and with the school. And it's been important and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you for being faithful uh, to God and faithful in your giving. We deeply appreciate it. Uh, as, we, as we leave, I want to leave you with this uh, charge and blessing. Sisters and brothers, sin distorts even the good gifts of God the law, the church, our own desires, but this need not lead us to despair. For God's love has overcome. God's love is overcoming. God's love will overcome, since power at work in the world. And may the God who brings good from broken desires, Christ who shares his yoke with us, and the spirit which breathes wisdom into our hearts, Sustain and guide us this day and every day. Amen. Have a blessed week.